Alright guys, like always, I have sent the lesson out to the members of the church. If you are visiting with us for the first time tonight, or have been visiting, uh, just get someone to forward that along to you, and it's a little bit easier to follow along. Um, you know, I think one of the, the hardest challenges I've given myself was over this past week in a daytime Bible discussion that we had on campus. And it wasn't something that I initially went in there noticing I was going to challenge myself on, but I was like, let me really take this, this kind of admonition that I've given to people. And the discussion was about complaining. Mm. And the main thing was do not complain since Tuesday to the next Tuesday. And I'm like, let me, let me actually try this out. And you start to realize, once you actually focus on it, how much we complain. And I started realizing how many little little remarks that I make about the weather, about what I'm wearing, what we have to do, that I started complaining a lot. And I was like, what am I doing? And I started to realize that we actually love to talk about our sufferings. Yep. Mm. We love talking about what's wrong in our lives and what's going on. And this didn't work out that well. Um, but we don't like talking so much about what's wrong with us. Ooh. We like to talk about what's wrong with our lives, but not what's wrong with us and why our lives are bad and what we're doing about it. Mm. You know, have you ever started a conversation and talk about how bad your life is and someone simply just responded, well, if you would just repent, Ooh. everything would go well. Ooh. You don't like those conversations, you know? No. I remember I had to get my mind around it because I actually, in the beginning when I first became a Christian, I thought I was clever. And I would set up this strategy where I would confess so I don't get baptized, uh, excuse me, so I don't get discipled, so I don't get, get, get corrected. So I would say, hey, I, I've poured out my life to you, so now you can't correct me because I already told you what's wrong. I already know. Wow. And uh, so it would happen where I would pour my heart out and then they would start correcting me. But, but I just told you what's wrong. You know, well, why are you still correcting me? See, sometimes we don't like talking about our own sins and we don't like it when we're the target of it. But we also don't like when someone else is a target and when we have to bring it up with them. Mm. You know, you start to see this even in the religious world today, that people have become so afraid to talk about sin, whether that's in themselves or somebody else, that they are pampered with sayings like, don't judge me. Mm. Only God knows my heart. Mm. You, you, you can't talk about it, right? Mm. And, and, and what's happened right now is in churches around the world are terrified of just getting in someone's life and dealing with sin. And they refuse to use words like sin or repentance. Maybe they'll preach it from the pulpit, from a, a personal life. They don't get into it. But we understand that as humans, suffering and sin are pretty much the sum of human struggles. Bad things that are going wrong in our lives, that are not in our control, and we are struggling with to understand God's sovereignty and all of these things, and the sin that we're struggling with ourselves. Mm. You know, that, that, that is pretty much the struggles of our lives. This means that we need one, of, uh, one another to help us with our struggles of suffering and our struggles with sin and its temptations. You know, James wrote this in James 5, 19 through 20. It says, My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the faith and someone brings them back, let them know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save his soul from death, that's one, and two will cover a multitude of sins. Mm. James here is showing the impact when one person decides to go and chase after the sinner, what they can do in their lives. Yeah. One, it says they can save their soul from death. But if that's not good enough, it says it can cover over a multitude of sins. I think that, that can mean so many different things. I think even if you bring someone back, that's covering over sins that they haven't actually done yet. Mm. You're, you're yeah. saving them from a, a future avalanche of sin that they were heading towards. You, you've just covered over that. Yeah. You've just made sure that they are not getting into that again. See, but this, this kind of language is, is not in churches of going and rescuing, helping people with their sin. You know, suffering, it hurts. But sin is hurts more. Your know, suffering will not last, but sin has the consequences that can reach into eternity. You know, sin is our most dangerous problem when we talk about sin or suffering. All Satan tries to do is to point us towards sin and away from God. 
But what is our goal in our lives with each other? It says here in Proverbs 27 verse 5, better is an open rebuke than hidden love. Wow. To get into someone's life and talk about the sin and, and to redirect them back to God. See, if we ignore our brother or sister's sin, in fact, we have actually sinned against them. If we ignore their sin and do not help them with it, it comes to a point where we have to ask for their forgiveness, for not caring enough to love them and get into their sin, into their lives. As we see in the Bible, and my lesson tonight is simply titled, How to Bring Up Sin, we're going to be looking at how our responsibilities is to look at the people around us and to help each other with the sin that we are suffering and the sin that we continue to do. It's not to point and judge each other, but it's to be there and to help people, hey, I want to save you from an avalanche of sin that you might be heading towards, and at the end of the day, save your soul from death. So when it talks about bringing up sin with other people, most of us, to be honest, I know I even had another conversation with the brother, is um, most of us, we're all good-hearted, but we don't have much wisdom. <laughs> that, that's most of our hearts, right? We're doing the best that we can. We love people. We care. But we need a little bit of direction of, hey, I see someone struggling with this, but I don't really know how to help them. Mm -hmm. And so that's the purpose of this lesson tonight, is how to get it in your own heart to have that confidence to bring up something to someone and how to do it as wise as possible. So point number one is examine yourself first. So before we set a course on attacking sin in someone else's life, we must focus our gaze on ourselves first. And we know that throughout the Bible it talks about these things. Um, but there are two essential things that we need before we bring up sin in someone else's life. One is we need humility. Understanding that we are just as much of a sinner as the one that we are trying to help. That we are, no, we are no better than them, we are no, we're, we're nothing, we're no, we're no higher on the scale. And that comes back to humility, having that in your heart. Going into the interaction, interaction, considering that you may have a plank in your eye and not even know it. Mm -hmm. Understanding that. So in Matthew 5, excuse me, Matthew 7, 3 through 5, we, this is where the scripture comes from, the understanding of that comes from. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. How can you say to a brother, let me take the speck out of your eye while all the time you have a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. He's saying here that even if you leave that plank you didn't notice, it's quite blinding. That that plank in your eye will not allow you to help to help somebody else's sin. It, 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 your own sin is blinding to yourself. And you can't actually have the ability to help people. So what this means is it does not mean that before you help somebody with their sin, you have to go and publicly talk about your sin. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean you have to be the first one to confess. It just means you have to understand where you are. That, that, that you are just as much of a sinner. If you take that that, that um, direction of, oh, I have to confess before helping out this person, you won't really be helping because you'll be emphasizing more on your sin than trying to help them out. Don't, you you got to stay focused on their sin, right? So, so this is just understanding that you got to be humble in the interaction, knowing that you're just as much of a sinner. But when it comes to humility and pointing out someone's sin, um, it's really hard when you actually do point out someone's sin you can never predict someone's response. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you might go in there and like, hey, this person, he's going to love this lesson I gave him and everything, but you, you never know how someone's going to respond. And I know I've kind of told this story before. People know this interaction. I remember when I first was on the mission team in Sydney, and I was, my, my role or my responsibility was just an usher. So I would help people in, I would set up the chairs and everything. And uh, I don't know what I was going through this day, but um, <laughs> uh, I was setting up the chairs and my church leader came up to me and the first thing he says is, hey man, you can set up the chairs a little bit better doing it this way. And I looked at him and I said, you don't want to ask me how my day's going? <laughs> you don't care about me? Why don't you love me? You know, I, I, just, I just went in on him. And, uh, you know, he was just like, 
it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> he, he didn't respond uh, like mad or anything, but you, you never know how someone's going to respond. <laughs> you know, I don't know what I was going through that day, but uh, I, I have apologized afterwards. <laughs> but, um, you know, going into there is, yes, seeing, viewing yourself, but you also have to go there is sometimes we think that we're going to win them over when we don't. And then we respond pridefully, you know, but I, I, I discipled you. I called you to change. Who are you? Mm. We're nobody. If someone decides to repent off of our advice, that, that's, that's, that's a privilege. Yeah. That's, that's, they, they don't have to. They, anybody at any time can walk away from God. For them to decide to still make Jesus their Lord is, is a privilege that we have in the kingdom. And for somebody to want our advice is a privilege. It's not, it's not, it's not a must. Mm. So understanding that when we go in there with humility, we have to humbly respond as well when someone's struggling through things. Mm. I know I just wrote a couple different responses here. Is you know even saying before you interact with their sin, it says, "Hey, before I've come to you, I've taken time to examine myself, and I find out that I'm I'm actually uglier than I thought I was. Um, I want to treat you as Jesus would have treated me in my sin. He's pointed out and he's helped me. Um, I hope that you would do the same." Uh, excuse me, you would have the same heart to help me with my sin as well. Mm -hmm. Going in there with a really humble response, it's like, hey, I know I messed up. I'm just coming here to love you as Jesus has loved me. You know, and if they start defending themselves, it's, is there anything that I've said that is, is offensive or wrong? Sorry, I just want to make sure that I, I'm getting myself out of the way. I want you to repent because God has called you to repent. And I, I don't want my interaction or my lack of wisdom to get in, in the midst of that. Mm -hmm. So really going in there with humility. But humility is sturdy in the face of anger. <clears throat> Even when someone's getting mad and they're getting defensive, you still be humble. And be like, sorry, I, I know this is how you're feeling, but I, I just I'm humble to the scriptures, not just to your feelings as well. Mm -hmm. It is not afraid to look at our own sin, yet it is not diverted from the concern of the others. Mm -hmm. So you go in there when you're pointing out a sin, you can see your own, but you're not diverted or running off and afraid to really get in there. So that's number one. You need humility when you talk about sin. Mm. The second thing is you need patience. You know, we understand, first of all, it's the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22. And it's also a quality of love in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Um, and we can forget how important patience is, not only in our relationships, but it's, vi it's a vital part of making us more like God. Mm -hmm. Consider the following thought. God is described as being love, right? In 1 John 4, 8. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Mm -hmm. So God is love. And one of the first things we understand or the most memorable scripture about love is 1 Corinthians 13. And the very first thing it describes love as being is patient. Mm -hmm. You know how Chris read up here, love is patient, love is kind, stop there? It's more of love is patient, stop there. That's, like, that, 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 that's where God is. Like We understand in the Bible, when it lists off things, it lists things off in importance. And so the very first thing it describes love as is being patient. It means that the one who is speaking, that we are speaking with, is like us. They may not respond perfectly. He changes slowly. He needs a patient helper. That's what we have to go in when we interact. That they're not just going to change like that sometimes. We have to be that one where you need to, you need to be willing to suffer for their sin more than they do. Mm. Think about when you first became a Christian or first studying the Bible, whatever it is. People had to be patient with you. I know for me, people had to really be patient with me. Mm. Um, I know I've said this before, but there's a lot of different times where... I was just doing my own thing. For me, when I look back at there, I'm like, how did they deal with me? Uh, right after I got baptized, a week later, I lost my Bible, and I didn't read my Bible for like three weeks. And I was like, what was I doing? I remember I had this one job. It was, uh, it was a Father's Day service. And my one job, they gave me money, and they said, hey, just go and buy some Father's Day presents. And I looked up on Google, I was like, okay, where's the 99 cent store? Let me just go find it. <laughs> um, and because uh, it was like the morning of, I totally forgot. <laughs> Sunday morning, morning of, I looked up 99 cent store. Let's For go. some reason, the GPS takes me about like a 40 minute drive from where oh, we were no. to this like little rink a dink shop <laughs> that was like a mom and pop shop. And there was just things scattered everywhere. But it was too late. We were there, we had to get something. 
Um, nothing was 99 cents. Oh. Um, we end up just finding the only thing that actually had like 20 of, nothing did, but we found these little pink piggy banks. No. And I was like, okay, well this is what we do. I, I got them, we got all the pink piggy banks, we brought it back to service, barely made it on time for service. I showed my church leader and he just looks at me and he's like, <laughs> Amen, brother. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we handed we handed it out to the to the dads in the service. But I know that that was something that I looked at. I'm like, man, they had so much patience for me. Um, and, and the thing when we get into that interaction with talking about someone's sin, before you get in there, you have to ask yourself: Are you willing to suffer for that sin more than they will? Wow. Are you willing to be patient with them through that all that that process of repentance? more than they will notice. See, patience is more interested in which way someone is facing rather than how fast that they are running. Mm. If you see them gradually still facing Jesus and, and, and steadily re, you know, doing their image to be more like Christ, that's all that you really care about. Mm. And that you are more interested in that they're facing the right way rather than that they're running crazy in, in some random direction. I know sometimes people come up and be like, hey, what do I need to learn? All the time people come up and say that if you're discipling somebody. My thing is just continue and be consistent on what I taught you last week. Just keep doing that. Keep facing the right way. And, and that, that will change your life more than trying to sprint off to some new direction every week. Mm. See, Jesus did not just come with truth, but he seasoned it with grace. Mm. In John 1 verse 14 it says, mm. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son. Who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This can teach us a, a, a very strong principle. Hold your truth if you're not going to follow up with grace. Mm. It would have been so different if Jesus only came with truth. If he came with no grace. The Jesus that we predict and understand and love now, it would have not have been the same Jesus. Mm. In the same way, when we bring up sin with other people... We have to season it with grace as well. It takes wisdom to bring up sin and a loving heart that focus on winning the other over. If you don't have love, it'll just make it worse and worse than it was in the beginning even. Um, you know, I, I've heard so many times where, you know, I remember there was a time where I was studying the Bible with somebody who was uh, struggling praying and... This person, he, you know, he, he was finding it difficult to pray and didn't really know how to get in there. And we were just trying to help him out. But the person that I brought along to actually help pray, instead of actually helping him pray, he starts confessing all his sin about he doesn't really pray that much. And I was like, bro, this is not helping the other person out. You're not, you're not looking at this person how to help him out, you know? And I was just like, what is this guy doing? Um, I remember there's one time, actually, it's not in my sermon, but uh, there was one time. Where I was in a Bible study, and we were talking about the doctrine uh, of just like how to be saved and everything. And in the middle of the study, this person starts going off and saying, we're preaching false doctrine. We're not doing it right. I was like, what in the world is this guy doing? You know, and it was crazy actually. But, um, you know, when we go and interact with somebody, we have to think more about them than what's going on in our hearts. You know? Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not about just going up and showing somebody their sin and just going up and blurting it out. You need to change. You need to change. But you really need to have a heart in there that's going to help somebody want to change. That you're going in there with love. See, it takes a lot of wisdom sometimes. In Proverbs 10, verse 12, it says, Hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers over all wrongs. Mm. First Peter 4, 8. Above all, love each other deeply. Because lover, love covers over a multitude of sin. See, without patience and love and humility, without grace and truth, you will enter interaction and set on your holy war of trying to help them, but leave defeated. You will leave room for temptations and self-righteousness and anger, resentment, speaking without love. You may not even care to pursue to talk about that sin any longer or just fully give up on them. Simply because you didn't have the wisdom to go in there with first love, patience, grace, and humility. See, it says here in Galatians 6, 1-2, brothers and sisters, If someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. 
But watch yourselves that you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burden, and in the same way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Looking at point one is before we even interact with the sin, is that we have to really prepare our hearts in humility, patience, and grace. And go in there with a complete heart focused on loving that other person. So point number two, helping the fellow sinner. So first of all, we have to first ask the question of this sinner, are they in the church or are they outside the church? See, we are always watching on a daily basis people in destructive behavior all day long. You walk outside the street and it's quite easy to find that this person sitting, this person, he's smoking, he's doing this, he lied, whatever it is, right? But it's not our job to go and confront the whole world about their sin, right? Because they haven't really even agreed to follow Jesus yet. So they don't care, to be honest. Lack of a better word, they, they don't really care. So that's not really our job to go out there. It's first to make them, hey, Jesus is Lord, and then we can confront the sin, right? In 1 Corinthians 5, through, uh, 5, verse 12, it says, What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? But are we not to judge those inside? He's saying here, I don't have any business running around on my holy war and trying to get those people to repent. My main thing is, if you are in the church, then there is a call of repentance. I'm going to judge you. That's where my business resides. So we must aim to see the good in their circumstances before we see the bad. Dealing with circumstances before dealing with sin sometimes. So what that is, is sometimes we'll, we'll jump in there and um, we want to go directly for the heart, dig deep and everything, without first at least addressing you know, um, the circumstances that are ha happening right now. Mm -hmm. And that person doesn't really have the opportunity to get deep in their heart because they're still focused on all the things that are right in front of them. It's kind of like even in medicine, right? Sometimes you have to focus on the symptoms before you focus on the cause. If somebody comes in with a fever, you don't just start taking out blood and everything. You know, you try and lower down the body temperature. In the same way, when someone comes in struggling and everything, take a moment. See what they're doing. See where they're at. See if you can help them at least calm down at first. And then you can dig in the heart. Mm -hmm. After the distractions and the situations are gone, then you can go back and ask why. What's going on? What's deeper in your heart? Sometimes sinful behavior um, coincides with anniversaries of loved one passing. Maybe they're reminded of a confronting memory that they, they, they didn't understand. Maybe they're stuck in a difficult situation that they don't even really know they're in. So we have to get away the fog first and then have an opportunity to sit down and talk about these things. Mm -hmm. Only deal with one sin at a time. You know, have a consistent relationship with them and see repentance to completion. Mm -hmm. Don't just focus on all of these different things. Focus on one thing at a time to completion. Have you ever said... Uh, have you ever, have you ever said when someone brought up sin to you, why didn't you tell me earlier? Mm. Right? Well, do you really want everyone to tell you every single sin all the time? No. <laughs> right? Sometimes we say, why didn't you tell me? Earlier? Why didn't you help me out earlier? You weren't ready. Mm. You were dealing with other sins. It's not our job to come up to you and confront every little sin in your life. No, we're, we're trying to just help you progress. Yeah. What if, you know, you, again, you weren't ready to face that particular sin? Sometimes you need time. So now we're going to talk about how do we actually talk about these sins. All right, so we'll go through a couple different advices. Um, when we talk about sin is we need to talk about it when someone is facing temptations. So in James 1, uh, 13 through 15... When tempted, someone should, should not, uh, no one should say, God has tempted me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away from their own evil desires and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, gives birth to death. It talks about here just kind of the progression of when it starts from sin, goes to desire, sin, and all the way down to death. Yeah. Spiritual death, and it can't even be physically, depending on what sin you're talking about. But when someone is about to enter a situation where they're going to be tempted to sin, that is a good time to bring up sin. Not after, but before, when they say, hey, I just want to help and talk about this. You're going in a situation where I know in my heart I might be tempted to sin. How do you feel about it? 
What, what are you preparing your heart in? Are, are you prepared to, to fight the temptations? What, what, what makes you be tempted? Get it before it actually goes and births into sin. You know, when, when can that happen? When someone is about to go away from the body of Christ for a long time? You know, they're not going to be at church for a long time, that they're going to be away. That can be a little bit harder and has more temptations. Set up times for that. Um, when someone's going to be in an environment that might tempt them. Talk about the sin and have a chance uh, before they have a chance to fall into it. Um, so that's one time when you talk about sin, when there's a, just a clear temptation that's going to happen in the future. The second is when you have seen the sin. Mm. Um, the hardest sin to address is the one that we see, but we receive no invitation to speak on it. Then we have to decide to either, do we call it out? Or do we just cover it over and pretend like we didn't see it? Or hopefully they all change, right? That's a decision that we have to make. Um, and that takes actually wisdom sometimes. Sometimes it is a sin that we have to talk about it right then and there. My notion and my understanding is if it's a public sin, then you have to address it publicly. So give me an example. If me and Tegan started arguing in front of the church and we were in sin and contempt or whatever in that, in that, in that interaction, we would have to address that sin publicly with the church. Why? Because it happened publicly, so it needs to be addressed publicly. Mm -hmm. If we address it privately and everything, people might still be like, oh, did, did, they, did they solve it? Did they not? So that's just kind of a, a wisdom thing. If it's a public sin, we are going to address it publicly with those who at least were in the situation. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so when you have seen the sin, it takes wisdom, but just because you have not been invited to talk about it doesn't mean that you're, you're, you're not welcome to speak about it. Um, the second thing is, you know, do not be fear, though. Do not be silent out of fear or out of anger. Most people uh, don't regret raising a sin if they raise it well, but they do regret being silent. You know, I, I remember there's a time where uh, back, this was all the way back in Los Angeles, where there were two, uh, a brother and a sister, and they were actually dating before they became Christians. And they broke up to become Christians separately, and then they came in. And they weren't really dating, but um, they started to have a secret relationship outside of the church. You know, started to be immoral and things like that. And they came to a point where they decided to fall away and leave God um, and, and just left the church. And there was somebody who came up and was like, man, I, 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 I saw that there sometimes, you know, going off and meeting with each other and everything and this person just started crying he's like I, I was just so scared to talk about it I didn't bring it up mm -hmm. and you know we it's hard to kind of reflect back on it amen we can learn from those things but it's like how would that have changed them if they just talked about the sin right in the beginning mm -hmm. do not be afraid or be silent just out of fear or out of even anger where you don't want to talk about it you know our fear of people's angry reactions, um, you know, we can't be afraid of that. The myth that help is needed only when asked for. we got to get that out of our mind, that people need help even that they're silent about it. In our sense that we have no right to say anything because ourselves are a mess, these have contributed to safe relationships rather than loving ones. So again, when people are afraid of other reactions and how they're going to hurt or feel judged, when um, that you have to wait to be asked for to help and that you can't say anything because you're in sin. These are all myths. They're, they're, they're not actually what build loving relationships. Um, when we talk about sins, kind of my seventh point right there, <laughs> is we got we to gotta talk about just the facts. Um, you need to hold up a mirror to them and see themselves clearly and not just what you have seen in them, or your emotions, or your opinions. Mm -hmm. Get them to see the facts about themselves. You need um, to help them see themselves in a clear way. Refrain from talking about how it hurt you, unless that will give them an example of how it can hurt other people. But um, this is just a feeling, it's, it's not a fact. You know, you got to help them see what the Bible says about their particular attitudes or their behaviors. Um, you can have the opportunity to talk about how you felt in your relationship later. You know, um, you know, talk about things like, hey, 
Today at church, you seemed a bit different. Uh, excuse me, a bit distant. You're sitting in the back and you didn't really talk to anyone. Is everything okay? Mm -hmm. You allowed them to see specifically what they did and what you saw and observed and see back, okay, well, this is what I did and now I know what I have to face. Mm -hmm. um, and so here, what if the other does not accept our words and refuses to hear? Um, perhaps we wait. Perhaps we persist and keep talking about it uh, because the matter is so important. Perhaps we get advice from a wise friend or perhaps we enlist someone else who has witnessed a sinful behavior and you guys go together. Um, we don't know. <laughs> if someone doesn't accept it, don't know. Have wisdom. Pray for it. There is no magic. Um, there's different things, different situations. Again, maybe you keep going. Maybe you're just patient. Maybe you just love. Maybe you get someone else to help you. Uh, let love guide you in that situation. Um, when someone confesses or discloses sin, that's when you should talk about it. If someone comes to you and confesses, our help takes a different form. The battle for getting private sin to public sin um, we, it, it, that's already won. We don't have to go and try and dig out the sin. They have come to you and started to talk about it. Um, but have you ever confessed a sin and seen like just a smile grow on someone's face? Like, man, I've been waiting to talk about this forever, you know? <laughs> where, where maybe you were trying to help somebody, you're studying the Bible with somebody, and they started confessing things. You're like, oh, yes. Um, but but we, we got to take our time. We got to go back in it. Um, first, we need to show our admiration. Thank you for confessing. Thank you for being open. You are showing love that you are trusting me to, to have your sin and to help you with that. We need to give it a thank you. Uh, but where do we go from there? One thing that people can make a, a mistake in doing is don't simply sympathize. This is a common mistake in either trying to match sin for sin or sympathize in someone's way and try to make them comfortable about their sin. Um, sometimes people will be struggling with, you know, impurity or pornography or whatever it is. And somebody will be like, oh, hey, I struggle with that too. Or sometimes I feel that way. Um, though the goal is to make them feel less alone or embarrassed, it takes the fight out of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And it builds comfort. Mm -hmm. So that's not actually a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. You want them to be in an all-out battle against their sin. You don't want them to feel any comfort in how they have just sinned. You don't want them to feel okay or whatever, that other people do it. No, you want them to just settle in their sin, settle in that filth and be like, don't you just want to get out of that? Mm. Okay, you can, you can talk about struggles later, but not at the moment. Don't just simply sympathize. Don't care about how they feel about themselves. Um, sorry, give me a second. Don't care about how they feel about themselves but help them to see how God sees them. The Bible teaches that Christians should have a, uh, the Bible doesn't teach, excuse me, the Bible doesn't teach that Christians should have a good self-image, but instead of a good Christ image. Very different things, right? Yeah. We're not just called here to be good and feel good about ourselves. We're, good, we're called to have a Christ image in our lives. So with that, we can't just build comfort um, in that, we have to make people to see where God sees them in the sin that they are in. We read here in 2 Corinthians verse 3 through 18, or chapter 3, 18. It says, And we all who have unveiled uh, faces um, contemplate the Lord's glory and are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. We all need someone in our lives that loves us enough to tell us the truth and not just want to tickle our itching ears. I know that there are some relationships as good that you can go and kind of confess and feel like the brotherhood and things, but then we also need people that are like, man, did you, did you just understand what you just confessed? The Bible says that God hates pride. Mm -hmm. like, that you shouldn't feel comforted at all when reading a scripture like that. Mm -hmm. and we need to have those deep conversations. Don't be misguided in building up self, but focus on building up Christ instead. Don't just build up their image, but build up the Christ image in them. In fact, the real you hungers and thirsts to be more like Christ. And not just to be told that your shortcomings are the results of your upbringing. And it's not really your fault. That 
the that flattery itches your ears of your self-image but does nothing to help your soul advance in life in genuine discipleship every person really wants to grow really does have a good heart of wanting to change and so we have to help that rather than them making them feel good about themselves so instead use the phrases like what can i do to help what can we do to fight this together let's develop a plan Let's bring in someone else to, to come here and help. Stay on track, offer partnership, humility and patience, but not a scapegoat. Don't let them get away with the sin. And by the end of it is what we talked about before is get into the heart. Sin is always a matter of the heart. Sin is always about God. And we understand that in Psalms. It's always personal and it's always relational. Sin is never impersonal. Remind them of who God is and who they are. Mm. Take, for example, the opening words of the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20, verse 2. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You know, when we read this and understand this, it talks about who God sees himself as and what the Israelites are. God first identifies who he is. He's a gracious God who acted first out of love, who brought them out of slavery and he identified who they were a people who once enslaved now liberated forgiven and brought into the house of god that they, 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 he started to bring that out to to the identifying god and identifying who they were in that relationship mm. um how do we know what's going on in someone's heart it's a little bit hard but we can learn from the israelites a bit um in their sin that they started to forget that that's who God was and where they have come from. Um, God cannot see me when I sin. Um, you know, so people started to think in that way, the Israelites, that God can't see me when I sin. Um, I have more freedom in e Egypt when I was back in slavery. I'm only human. Sometimes people can react that way. Everyone sins. Why are you picking on me? Um, and sometimes people can even react in the way that I must be a better person to get back to God. Mm -hmm. um, so when we dig in people's hearts, we have to kind of eliminate each one of these things and get to, the, to where the sin is really coming from. And the last thing we need to do when we point out sin is we needed to develop a plan. If you end the conversation with someone saying, I'm just going to try better, you better bet that you're going to have that same conversation next week. Right. Mm. It, it's not good enough to say, I'm just going to do better. I'm just going to try harder. It, it never really works out. Um, another mistake that we can have, though, is sometimes we go in there and we have our plan and what we think they should do. That's not very helpful. Instead of us just being the solution for them, we have to get them to be their own solution makers. We got to go in there and be like, hey, this is your sin. Uh, what are you going to do to repent? Mm. How are you going to change? Put the emphasis on them that they need to change rather than we have this list of to-do lists, mm -hmm. right? Because they need to be invested in their own righteousness. So set up a time to hold them accountable for what they say they are going to do. You can give them some practicals and stuff, but at the end of the day, it's them making the plan. Let them to be the problem solver. Teach them to have their own spirituality in their own hands. You know, at the end of all these things... Um, again, we're talking about bringing up sin within the church, not those outside the church. That's a different realm of, of addressing it, right? It's helping someone repent and make Jesus the Lord of their life. But in all these things, um, you know, we, we are a church of sinners. That, that's why we came together as Christ's body. Is we're, we're like, hey, we're all not good enough. And that's why we decided to become Christians. And to have someone who's still struggling with sin... Struggling shows that there's evidence of, of a fight. Yeah. You know, it shows evidence that there that you have some power. Have you ever tried like doing something where you, you, you're, you're not really struggling? You just completely failed. That's like me playing like guitar, right? I don't struggle to play with guitar. I fail at guitar. I don't, I don't, I, it, it's, not, it's not a struggle. If you see someone struggling with sin in their life, that means they're still fighting. They still have the ability to change. They're still holding on. And so when we go in, when we address sin in people's lives, Definitely pray beforehand about your own heart going in there. Humility, patience, um, having your own self-view and understanding that you're just as much of a sinner in them. And that's just pray for wisdom. A lot of my second point, it's not going to be magic for every single person. 
right? You got to read these things and like, okay, what works for this particular person? But I think what we learn at least, and you've seen in many different scriptures throughout this lesson, is that love covers over a multitude of sin. Sometimes it's even your sin when you're trying to point out someone else's sin. If you just go in there with love and people see the sincerity and the genuineness of your heart, that's when people will start to change as well. And thank you guys. That is the lesson for today. Awesome. So I know it was